Now am I on? Yeah. You know, there are some mornings, some Sunday mornings, when um, the music that we sing just so perfectly says it all. Um, I know that the, the sermon and preaching and the Word of God is, uh, is the central event here as a Bible church, but I got to tell you, thank you, worship team, for the, the songs this morning because they are perfect for our text today. I'd like you to pray with me, if you would, please. Father, we do thank you for the power of the resurrection of Christ. We, we praise you that he is high and exalted and lofty and seated at your right hand in the heavenly places. And we're grateful for our position in Christ. We, too, are with him there in Christ. It boggles our mind. We don't understand it. But, Lord, in the next couple of weeks as we... We see him lifted up and we see ourselves, may we understand it in its fullness, that it would not be theological notes that we put on a page, but living truth that transforms our lives into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So for that purpose, Lord, we look to your word and we ask that it would have its way in our lives today. Thank you, Lord, for its power and for yours. In the name of Christ, we do pray. Amen. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that we would be equipped for everything, every good thing. And we're in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read this morning verses 20 through 23. In fact, I think we'll read verses 18 through 23 just so we have the uh, proper context. So would you please stand? Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, and we are going to read verses 18 through 23. Please give attention to the reading of God's word. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power Toward us who believe, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection, under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This week on Wednesday, November 11th, there are two significant birthdays. And uh, first is the birthday of the United States Marine Corps, November 10th. Oorah, I heard an oorah somewhere. (laughs) Uh, Last night I had the privilege of taking part in the 240th uh, local birthday ball of the United States Marine Corps. And it's just great to be part of a ceremony like that. Marines do it right, believe me. It was just fantastic. But the Marine Corps represents a fighting force to be reckoned with. Um, as they say in the military, we project power. All forces do. There's sea power, there's air power, there's power on the land, and that, that power is projected toward an enemy. And the Marine Corps has been known as one of the fiercest fighting forces in all of uh, military history. In fact, in World War II, World War I, rather, 1918, at the Battle of Bella Wood, the Germans called the Marines devil dogs. And that name stuck because of the ferocity of their and tenacity of their fighting against them. And so Marines are often called devil dogs, not in a demonic sense, but just talking about their ferocity. So 240 years old, the Marine Corps is, November 10th. But there is another birthday on November 10th. Martin Luther. Now what does Martin Luther and the Marine Corps have to do with one another? power, still power. How many 
former Lutherans do we have? We're all Protestants, and so, but uh, <clears throat> Martin Luther, we're, we're Protestants because of this man, this man who had the, the courage to stand up against the Catholic Church, and he, he was moved by the power of God's Word, reading the book of Romans, and he recaptured and renewed and reformed the, the church around the, the, that wonderful theology of justification by faith through grace. And it was the power of God's word and the power of God that worked through Martin Luther to start this movement called the Reformation and the Protestant Church, of which we are part. It's power, huge power. Now, obviously, there are different kinds of power, right? There's military power. There's power in someone's arm. There's uh, political power. There, all, there is spiritual power, political power, all sorts of powers. But what we'll see this morning is God has them all. It's not just there's God's power, and then there's the military might of the United States Navy or uh, Army or Air Force, whatever it may be. No, there is a power that God owns, and every kind of power is his, infinitely He owns every kind of power. They are resident in him. So God's power encompasses every type of power that you could even conceive of. So why do we bring this up? Because last week we saw Paul pray, and hopefully by looking at that passage, we are learning or have learned how to pray like the Apostle Paul. But there were three things that he prayed specifically for, um, beginning in verses 18 and 19, he said, you have had your eyes opened. At the cross of Christ, when you came to Christ, you now have spiritual perception, and having that spiritual perception, there was this prayer for a greater grasp of redemption. He'd been talking in, in the, he's been talking in the, chap, the chapter about all the things, the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, and he prays at the end, God, help him to understand it, help him to get it, help him to comprehend and grasp these truths so that they would be life-changing. So there were, was prayer for a greater grasp of redemption, of our hope of salvation, the hope of his calling, we saw. Of our glorious value as God's inheritance, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in, in the saints. And the last thing that he prayed for is that we would know what is the surpassing greatness of his power and our being the object of that infinite power. He said that we are the object of that power and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us, toward us who believe. His power was projected toward us. We are the object of that infinite power and he, and he, he described it with as its surpassing power. He said it is greatness, it is power, it is, it is a working kind of power. He calls it strength and he calls it might. These six different words that, he, that he all mean power and he's saying you need to know that God's power is powerful. Do you get it? God's power is powerful. And this is what God wants us to know this morning. Basically, when all is said and done, He wants us to realize his infinite power in Christ so we would personify his presence on earth. There's a purpose to this power. It's not just to go, wow, pretty big, it's pretty amazing. This is a power that is worked out in a certain way. Verse 20, it says, God works his power in Christ. It says, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. That word brought about is the same word for energy that we saw in the previous verse. He worked it out. He affected it. He accomplished it in Christ. Our redemption is accomplished in Christ. It, without Christ, there is no redemption. Without Christ, there isn't any salvation or forgiveness of sins. And this happens through his power. It was accomplished in Christ. We've seen this throughout chapter 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. He adopted us as sons in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption. In him we have been made an inheritance. In him we have been given the spirit. In him we have all of these things. We are positionally in Christ. Our redemption is accomplished in Christ through his power. And we must always remember where we reside. We are in Christ. We are in the beloved. We've been placed into him. We are, you, we are united with him. Our identity is with Christ in everything about him. And so we must, we start with this idea that he has worked this out, all of this in Christ. Now he's described this power as, as surpassing its great, its strength, its might. It's, uh, it's just this crazy power that he wants us to understand. But what's the point? What's the point? Dodge has a new charger. You guys seen this? 726 horsepower. It's power. 726 horsepower. It boggles the mind to think of an automobile with that much horsepower. And you can go into the, uh, the showroom and look at the new Dodge Charger, and, and the, the salesman can tell you all about torque and and the transmission that's in it, and what horsepower, and how it's the, probably one of the most powerful cars ever built. And you go, but what does it do? Oh, you want to see what it does? We'll take you for a ride. We'll give you the keys to the car. Or you might have a computer. You're buying a computer, and the salesman says, he's talking about how much RAM it has, and how much disk space it has, and, and the clock speed of the processor, and the speed of the bus, and and, and all of these things, is it says, this is a powerful computer sitting there on that desk. And you're, you're, what do you say? Well, what does it do? What can it do for me? You can describe the power, fine, of a, of a Dodge Charger with 726 horsepower. I think it's 726 point something, but anyway. Um, or a very fast computer, but what does it do for me? How does it work? And that's what the rest of this passage is all about. God worked his power in Christ by raising him from the dead. He can describe how great the power is with all these superlatives and all these adjectives. It's great, it's mighty, it's strength. But how was that power effected in Christ? By raising him from the dead. Don't pass over that. We must not pass over that. Verse 20 says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Better translation is by raising him from the dead. That's how, that's how he brought it about, and that's how it was demonstrated, by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is essential to our redemption. There is no forgiveness without the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the gospel by which we are saved as Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. But he also says, if Christ is not risen, we are pitiful people. This is a charade. What are we doing here this morning? We're just making it up. It's not real. There's no reality to our faith. We are still in our sins if Christ did not rise from the dead. It is, as I have said many times, the jugular vein of Christianity. If Christ did not rise, we are in. There is no hope for us. There is no hope of our calling. If Christ did not rise from the dead, there, is no, there are no spiritual blessings in the heavenly places for us. There is no hope of his calling. There is no uh, um, glory of the riches of the inheritance in the saints. None of these are affected and fulfilled until Christ rose from the dead. They're not theoretical. His power is not theoretical. It's not statistical on paper. It is real and it is affected in the, in the resurrection of Christ. Now, what kind of power does it take to rise a dead person? Jesus was crucified, and the Romans wanted to make sure he was dead, so they ran him through with a sword, and blood and water came out. His heart may have been pierced. His whole pericardium, is that the right word for it, the, the sack around? And uh, blood and water came out. He was dead. He wasn't in suspended animation for three days. He, he wasn't in a cold tomb, and so his heart slowed down. No, he was dead. We have people today who talk about near-death experiences. They're not dead. When someone says, I died twice on the operating table, you didn't die. Death is irreversible. 
Death is when they issue a birth, uh, birth a death certificate. When you have the death certificate, that means you're dead. Certified. Otherwise, you are resuscitated. And Jesus was not resuscitated. He was resurrected. And on that third day, after his heart having been stopped and, and bled profusely, all the wounds and all the things that had happened to him, and he's dead for three days, boom, his heart began to beat. His lungs filled with air. His eyes opened. He stood up. He walked. He talked. He ate for 40 days. He didn't eat for 40 days, but he, ate. he did all those things. He was a living Savior, resurrected for, from the dead for 40 days. And this is God's infinite power. I mean, we don't have anybody who can raise someone from the dead after three days. This is the power of God toward us, projected toward us. And remember, Paul, this is, Paul is still praying here. He's still praying that we would understand this power. And he's praying, will you, God, help them to understand the, the resurrection power, understand your power ha, as it was affected in the resurrection. And it wasn't just the fact that he raised one man from the dead, but through the resurrection, death itself was defeated. Sin that resides in our lives and, 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 and we struggle with, it was defeated with his resurrection. And every demonic force that has uh, been a, against God from the very beginning until the end of time, they were defeated at the cross and at the resurrection. That is infinite power. And this power resides in us. That's why he's praying this. Lord, help them to understand this. Help them to understand the, the, the surpassing greatness of your power. Demonstrated in raising Christ from the dead. That power is in us. Why is it in us? Because we are in Christ. We are in the beloved. And where is the beloved? He's raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father. So that power is in us. And that is the prayer that we would understand this power He's praying that we would real, realize this power that has been projected toward us in our redemption. We are the object of that power. But it doesn't stop there. God worked his power in Christ not only by raising him from the dead, but by seating him, seating him in the supreme place of authority. Verse 20, he says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him, at his right hand, in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Christ's supremacy is over every earthly power. Now, he raised him from the dead. That took infinite power. And then it says he seated him and... and so that assumes that he, since he is seated at the right hand of the Father, the right hand of the Father, always uh, pictured in the scriptures, is the throne of God, the throne room of God in heaven. You see it in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, book of Revelation. And we see it here. So how did Christ get from raised from the dead to at the right hand? Through the ascension. Not only did he live on this earth for 40 days, at, you know, with the power of, the, of, of God in him who raised him from the dead. But on the 40th day, when, before his disciples, he was literally and physically raised up through the atmosphere into another dimension. Yes, we really believe this stuff. Into another dimension, into the dimension of the throne of God. The heavenly places where our blessings come from. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he raised him up and seated him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. That's where he is physically now. But he is at the right hand of the Father. This is the place of authority. This is the place of honor. And, and you see in the Old Testament, for instance, in the book of Isaiah, you know, the, this beautiful picture of God, the throne room of God, and, and Isaiah sees the, the, the train of his robe filling the temple, and the seraphim are, 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 um, are, are flying around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. But there's no one sitting at his right hand. 
it is in some sense an incomplete picture because of the rest of the story is that he would send his son from that place who would become one of us, who would die for our sins, who would rise from the dead and then come back to sit at his right hand, a picture of completion. He has completed the work of redemption. It is done. It is finished because of the resurrection power of God exerted in him and accomplished in Christ. And that resides in us. Seated at the right hand of the Father, place of authority, the place of honor. And he also says that this place where he is seated is far above all rule. There is no ruler. There is no king. There is no president. There is no monarchy. There is no general. There is no prime minister that is greater or even comes close to Christ. No one. Against, he is above all rule and authority. What kind of authorities do we have? The Constitution of the United States, Uniform Code of Military Justice, the Magna Carta, the North Atlantic Treaty. There are all sorts of, of uh, documents. There are local magistrates that... that that uh, demonstrate authority, but guess what? There's no authority that even comes close to the authority of Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. There is no power, no, no physical strength, no political strength, no military might, no, no uh, popularity because some people have, have uh, power because they're popular in popular culture. They don't know anything, but they have power to influence people. But there isn't any power that is as great or even comes close to the power of Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. And no dominion, whether it's the United States of America, the European Union, an Islamic caliphate, they do not compare in any sense. And there is no name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This is a comprehensive statement. He says, there isn't any power, any place, in any time, now or forever, that even comes close to the greatness of the resurrected Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's the power that he prays that we would understand in our lives. What kind of power is that? It's... it's it's phenomenal. It's, it's hard for us to even begin to understand. And there is no earthly power that even comes close. But even though we might um, apply that this way, I think Paul is probably talking more about spiritual powers. And so Christ's supremacy is over every spiritual power as well. I mean, there are different kinds of powers. There are earthly powers of might, politics, for instance, military power, but there is also spiritual power, and that's probably what Paul is talking about here. Rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. In Ephesus, the background of Ephesus is that there was a lot of, magi there were a lot of magical powers. Read the book of Acts. There were, there were people... Uh, practicing the dark arts. There were demonic forces. There was the, the cult of Artemis. There was a lot of demonic activity in Ephesus. And he's going to come back to that in chapter 6. In chapter 6, he, he says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers. He uses the same words. Against the world forces of this darkness. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In the heavenlies. So there is this great war that is going on in the heavenly places. And in the atmosphere. And where we live. And when we uh, battle against politics or people or uh, places or whatever it may be. Against rulers on this earth. Guess what? We're not really fighting against them. Those who fight, you know, why are there evil people in this world? Why are there evil people doing evil things, whether it is uh, uh, ISIS or uh, kids shooting up uh, other kids, you know, in schools, or uh, child abuse, and all of the things that we face in our society? Is it, uh, you know, what is behind it all? There is a struggle that is not against flesh and blood. We have a real enemy, and, and 
And Paul is going to come back to that in chapter 6. So put a placeholder in chapter 6. But at this point, all we need to know is this. His power is infinitely more powerful than any power in this universe for all time. And that's the power that he prays that we would understand that resides in us and with us. And again, that should be life-changing. So if he says that his power is greater than that, why do we still struggle? There is a battle that still rages, and that's why Paul says we do not struggle against flesh and blood. But we're not going to be done with the struggles until we're free from this life. But in the meantime, the reason he's telling us that we have this power available to us is because we will continue to struggle with relationships, financial problems, with health issues, with spiritual issues, with emotional issues, all sorts of things. We will continue to struggle, but we need to know, and he wants us to know, and he prays that we would understand that we have a power resident in us that has already defeated all of those. Already. And that's what he says next. God worked this power in Christ by subjecting everything to him. Verse 22 says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. All things means all things. He put all things in subjection under his feet, under someone's feet. I mean, we got the picture, right? We can understand what it means when someone's at your right hand. We can understand what it means when you have your, your foot on the neck of someone else. This is the word for submission, hupatasso, which means to rank yourself below another. But here, this is not voluntary. This is not a voluntary bowing to Christ. This is total defeat of any hostile force against God. Yes, some will willingly bow, and they will come, and they will willingly accept his redemption. But he is talking here about he has put all things in subjection. He has subjugated, you might say, every power and every type of power and every dominion and every name under his feet. It's a complete, total victory for Christ. Total victory. There's no mop-up. He's done. He has finished the work because everything is now seated under his, his, his feet. The entire universe obeys him. The entire universe is subject to Christ, which means God is in control of all things and I am not. Yeah, that might be a good one to write down, huh? Any control freaks out there? Uh, um, don't, he, he's not going to control me by getting me to raise my hand. <laughs> We're all control freaks to some extent. But we must submit to God. We do so willingly. Every knee, knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But if you are a believer, you've already bowed to him. And to bow to him means more than just saying, hey, give me salvation. Hey, forgive my sins, please. No, it means I bow to him as the Lord and sovereign over my life. If he's, if he's the Lord and sovereign over the universe, isn't he the Lord and sovereign over my life? And we bow in subjection to him voluntarily and we do so lovingly and willingly, and he loves you and he has your best interests at heart. And so when things come into your life, whatever's in your life right now, and you're, you're saying, God, why? What is going on here? Why would you do this to me? Guess what? He's in control and you're not. By, by even asking the question, why, what's going on here? You're saying, this is out of my control. It's out of my purview. I don't have the ability or the strength to even affect anything here. And, and it's out of control. No, it's not out of control. Nothing is out of control. God is always in control. That is comforting, ladies and gentlemen, to know that God is always in control, regardless of what is happening in our life. We just have to give in to that power. We need to give in to that truth. We need to give in to that sovereign rule because that's the place of peace. It's a place of hope. It's a place of 
Relaxation is the, the place where we can be effective and calm and full of joy in the midst of whatever is raging around us because he put all things in subjection under his feet, everything in the universe. What kind of God is this that we have to do with? What is this all about? It's, and Paul is praying, help them. And I pray that even I would understand this. What does this mean? It's hard to comprehend, but he's asking God to, sh- to open our, our, our eyes even more to comprehend and to understand the full significance of what it means that Christ rose from the dead, is ascended on high, seated at the right hand of the Father, and everything in the universe is subject to him. He's in control, and I am not. And I praise him for that, as we should all. The last thing that he says that God worked, how he worked God's power in Christ is this. By giving Christ to the church over all things. It says, and he put all things in subjection under his feet. And now notice this. He gave him, Christ, as head over all things, to the church. He gave Christ to the church as head over all things, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is the head of the church So not just the supreme power over the universe, but the supreme authority over the church. He gave him as head. The word head means authority. We have no we know what that means to put someone in subjection under our feet, to be at someone's right hand, and we know what it means when you say, Hey, you're not the head of me. But then we say to Christ, Oh yes, he is the head of us. It means authority. His supreme, and this is what we're talking about in context, the supreme authority and power of Christ, and that supreme authority and power of Christ is given as the head of the church. But he gives Christ to the church. Christ is the head of the church. I'm not. The elders are not. There isn't some synod or some apostle or some session or whatever. Christ is the head of the church. He and he alone. He has the supreme authority, the supreme power. And he delegated that power to the apostles and the prophets, and we'll see that. This is the first time the word church and the subject of church is, is, uh, is used by the apostle Paul. And he's going to, like many things in chapter 1, he introduces these topics. And here he introduces the topic of headship, and he's going to talk about that later Um, In chapters 2, 3, and 5, he introduces the idea of the church, and he's going to talk about that in the same chapters. And he introduces the idea of the fullness. He's going to talk about that more in chapter 3 and chapter 5. So Paul introduces a lot of topics in chapter 1, and this is the first time that he mentions the idea of the church, and it is the culmination and the high point of this whole chapter and his prayer that Christ's fullness would be seen in the church. He is the head of the church, and we, the church, are his body. The idea of the body, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and we're going to see more about this in uh, chapter 4. He will talk more about the body of Christ But right now, all he is saying is Christ is the supreme authority over the church. He's given to us. He is the gift that God gave to us as the supreme head, and we are his body. But then he says this, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are the full representation of Christ to and in this world. How will people know Christ? The church. Not just by, this is the corporate nature. We together display the love of Christ. And he began this prayer by saying, you know, I give thanks for the faith that exists among you and your love for all the saints. A, A genuine faith, when there is this genuine faith that is expressed in the church, by this will all men know that you are my disciples as you have, as you have love for one another corporately. 
we need the church, the, the local body of Christ and the universal church. It is, is so important. And I know so many people say, well, you know, I don't really, I don't do the church thing. I just, you know, read my Bible once in a while. I'll go to this church and that church. Can you do that as a, as a football player? Yeah, I don't really go to practices. You know, I don't go to games. I just play on my own. Yeah, I'm a sailor, but I don't really go do anything. I'm just... I'm a sailor on my own. I just do that stuff. And yet we have some crazy idea that we are somehow detached from the body of Christ. And a part of it is American individualism, the, the privatization of our faith that we just, you know, it's me and Jesus and that's all I need, a personal relationship with Christ, how important that is. But you cannot live the Christian life apart from the church. And the point that he's making here is that the fullness of Christ is seen in us as a corporate body. The church is filled by the fullness of him. In in chapter 3, verse 19, there are two great prayers in in Ephesians, one in chapter 1 that we've been looking at. There's another one in chapter 3, and and he ends it by praying that believers would be filled with, to the fullness of God. And he ends this prayer by saying, we have been given the church, which his body, the fullness of, of him who fills all in all. In chapter five, he's going to say, be filled with the spirit. And I believe that being filled with the spirit means being filled with all the fullness of Christ. When you are full of Christ, what are you full of? Christ likeness. His power and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things are a picture of Jesus Christ. And when we together are full of Christ, we are to the world the manifestation of what he is like, who he is, what is glorious. He went away. He is raised on high. He is seated at the right hand physically. But he sent his Spirit to live in us and to fill us with Christ that the world would see him. That's who we are. That's what we do, and that's why his power resides in us, because we can't do it without his power. And he says, God, please help him to understand. And he's saying that to us, God, help us to understand this power that raised Christ from the dead, that seated him at the right hand, that put everything in the universe under his feet, and he is in us, that we would see that and we would, we would fulfill everything in Christ. So, God wants us to realize his infinite power in Christ so we would personify his presence on earth. That's all we were saying this morning. Do you understand? I know it's, we're all grasping to understand how great this power is. It's greater than, you know, we talk about volcanoes and earthquakes and nuclear power and atomic bombs and all these things that we think are so uh, incredibly powerful. Nothing touches his power. Nothing. He wants us to realize his infinite power is in Christ. And guess where we are? We are in Christ. So we would personify his presence. We would manifest it. We would complete his presence on this earth. There was a missionary who went to a third world country. And when he got there, he inherited this old car. And the only way you could start it was by pushing it. Anybody ever have a car like that? <laughs> uh, manual transmission. And so he got kind of creative. And everywhere he went... With this car, you know, he would either park it on a hill or he would leave the engine running or he would uh, order his time and, uh, and organize things so he was going to pick someone up, some kids or some teenagers, someone who would help him to start the car. And, and he did that for two years. And then he uh, fell into ill health and was going to go home from the mission field and they sent his relief. And when his relief got there, he gave him the car. And he began to describe to him, this is a car that won't start unless you push it. The other missionary goes, hmm, open the the hood. Goes, oh, the wire to your starter is loose. (laughs) (laughs) 
we do the same thing with the spiritual power that is available to us. We live as powerless when he has given us the resurrection power of Christ and we think, we, oh, I can't do that. I don't have the ability. I'm no good. We live as paupers when we have the, the inheritance, the glorious inheritance of the saints and we have this great, all of these promises and we live like, oh, I just, I don't have anything. I have nothing to offer. I'm just worthless. We live as timid, fearful babies sometimes where oh, I just, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I can't do that. I think too many things that are going on around me that I just don't know how to handle. He has not given us spirit of fear and timidity. We have a, a spirit of love and we have a spirit of God's power toward us. His power is projected toward us. We are the object of that infinite power. We're not scaredy cats. We shouldn't be. And no matter what we face in this world, we can understand that no matter whether we look at the politics that are going on and the things that are going on in the world, guess who reigns? Guess who is on the throne? Guess who will make all things right? And our focus is to make him known, not to elect a candidate. You can do those things. We should be involved in those things. But our responsibility as a church is to embody the fullness of Christ and that power by living out individually lives victorious over sin. And you have that power. Don't live in timidity. And one of the most powerful things we can do is pray. When we pray, we're asking this great God of the universe who has subjected all things to do something that we can't do. And he can, and he will if it's his will, but we're saying, I'm not in control, and you are. And prayer is one of the most powerful things we can do. That's why this is all a prayer. Paul is praying. And I pray that too. And we should all pray that he will answer that for us so that we will ultimately be that fullness of Christ to this world. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of Christ. It is powerful, as you said, beyond our wildest imaginings. And we pray, Father, that we would uh, embody the fullness of Christ. And we confess to you, we're just simply saying we can't do this on our own. And when we do it, it's sin or it's just selfishness. But we, we seek as a church body, as a church family, to embody and to personify all that Jesus is by the power of your spirit and the power of your word. Thank you that it's there for us. May we be men and women of faith and love who reach out and take hold of all that you have given to us. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, thank you for giving them to us. Amen.